Hi everybody! Uh, welcome back to Super Awesome Calculus. I'm Augie Kennedy and today we're starting Chapter 4 entitled Everything is Derivative. Now this chapter corresponds with Chapter 4 from James Stewart's Calculus book, 6th edition Early Transcendentals. So in this chapter we're going to look at all of the different ways that we can use derivatives. We spent the last chapter exploring the different rules that go uh, that correspond with derivatives now we're going to learn what they're good for and so that's that means that we're going to go over a lot of practical applications and the first thing that we're going to look at is how derivatives are going to affect a graph or affect values and we're going to look at a concept called maximum and minimum values now this idea is actually very simple to uh, illustrate because we can see I mean, you probably are familiar with the idea of a maximum and a minimum. So here, for instance, is a function of some sort. All right. The maximum, the highest point on this function, appears to be right there. And the lowest point on this function appears to be right down here. So maximum, minimum. You can say that those are the maximum and minimums of a function. Um, the way that you can, the way that you can figure out what a, uh, there are two types of maximums and minimums. There is the uh, local maximum and the idea of an absolute maximum. Uh, to illustrate this, we can draw another function. I'm going to draw one that looks an awful lot like the last one. Here we go. One. Okay. And let's pick a number a and some number over here c. Okay? And we're going to pick another number over here d and some number over here e. And this is f of x. Now, what a local maximum or local minimum means is that if I'm just looking at the function f of x between A and C. Well, the maximum is very obviously right here. That's a maximum. And the minimum looks to be right on A. Like where A starts, it appears that that's the minimum of the function. These are called local minimums and local maximums. If we go over the entire function from D to E, we can find that the global maximum, the absolute maximum, is right here. Boom. Which I guess would be point F. And the, uh, the absolute minimum is right down here. G. So that's a visual idea of what they are. The book gives a more precise definition, a more technical definition, but if you intuitively understand graphically what it means, you're good to go. Now, this idea brings us to a fairly important theorem called the Extreme Value Theorem, or EVT. The Extreme Value Theorem. And it states that if f, some function, is continuous, on a closed interval, on a closed interval, and we'll call that interval A, B, then F attains its maximum value in absolute, absolute max f of c and in absolute minimum min f of d at some numbers c and d in a and b. What that means, what that long theorem means, 
is that if you have a function that's continuous on that interval, well, then it's at some point, and this makes logical sense, intuitive sense, at some point between these two numbers, if the function's continuous, it's going to be as high as it can go, or it's going to be as low as it can go. It's going to be one of those two things. And the way we can see that, we can see that pretty easily. We can see that if this is a function, all right, if that's a function, and this is a, and this is b, then at some point in this function, it's going to be as high as it can get, right there, and as low as it can get, right there. Uh, because it's a closed interval, that means that you can check exactly where, like, you can check the endpoints, a and b. Um, it also works in functions like this. Here's a function. This line, right there. That is, uh, and that's B, continuous between A and B. Its local, or its absolute maximum and minimum would be the same value in that case, because it's, all, it's a straight line. Um, now keep in mind, there are cases where a function isn't continuous. Uh, for instance, a, when there's an asymptote, let's say there's an asymptote at B, that doesn't really work. Also, if it's a piecewise function, and we get something hideous that looks like this, like open, and then here, closed, and that doesn't necessarily have a, an absolute maximum there that you can easily find at a precise point. So, that's just something to bear in mind. Now, let's go back and let's look a little bit at what happens to these functions when they reach a maximum or a minimum? We're going to go back to our, I like to call it the camelback function. Like that. All right. Let's look at that function. Let's look at what happens when it reaches a maximum or a minimum. Well, we, we look right here. That looks like a maximum. That looks like a global maximum. That looks like a local minimum, a local max. That looks like a local min. All right, so we can see, let's look at the uh, shape of the graph at that point. If you can see the tangent lines that I drew to those local and global uh, maximum and minimums, you can see that the tangent line is horizontal, which means that it has a slope of zero. The graph has a, the tangent line to the curve at a maximum or minimum has a slope of zero. And the slope at, of the tangent line at a point in a curve is, of course, the derivative, which leads us to Fermat's. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, I, know he's, uh, I know he's French. Uh, so Fermat, I don't know, Fermat's theorem. Uh, anyway, that guy, this guy right here, I'll, I'll spell his name I'm using a red marker because this black one is a piece of junk. Fermat, or for Fermat's <laughs> theorem, says if f has a local max or min at C, and if f of c, the derivative f prime c, exists, then f prime c equals zero. That's very simple. That basically, that we, we just went over exactly why that's the case graphically. The book can prove it, but you don't need to prove it. You can see it. Um, now this brings us to an idea of a critical number. A critical number relates to maximums and minimums, and that is whenever um, there is a number, if we've got a function, the, the definition reads as such. <clears throat> a critical number of a function f is a number c in the domain of f 
such that either f prime c equals zero or f prime c does not exist. This is very easy to understand. Two examples. Oh, come on, marker. Come on, marker. How are you going to let me down like this? Apparently very easily. All right. Here's an example of a critical number. F of x equals absolute value of x. And here's an example of a critical number. F of x equals x squared. Now we can see right here at zero, at the number c, we remember that the absolute value function is not differentiable because the corner is too sharp. It's not continuous and smooth. So zero in this function is a critical number. Right here, we, in x squared, we know that the derivative is zero at zero. So a critical number here would also be zero. Just because you're calling something a critical number doesn't mean you're calling it a maximum or a minimum. It just means that it's a number that you'll need to examine. And the way that we're going to find, the way that we can find maximums and minimums with relative ease is by using the closed interval method. This is pretty, this is pretty good. It helps us find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum of any function. Here's what you do. If you've got a function, here we go, f, that's a function, is on a, b, closed interval. That means you'll need to use the endpoints. Here are the three steps to find the, max, the absolute maximum, absolute minimum. One, find values of f at critical numbers in open intervals a, b. Now what that means is that you're going to want to differentiate f and set the derivative equal to zero. So you've got f of x, take the derivative and set it equal to zero and see what points you get. Second, find values of f at endpoints. A and B. And finally, largest is your absolute max, smallest is absolute minimum. So the Augie closed interval method says take your function, differentiate the function, set that derivative equal to zero. Any point where you get a zero, or you're basically going to get a critical number, any point where it's undefined, you've got a critical number, examine all of those critical numbers, and examine the endpoints A and B. Plug those, when I say examine, I mean take those numbers and plug them back into the original function. So for instance, if f prime x equals zero at two, and at five, that means plug 2 and 5 into f of x. See, use the computation and see what you get. So for instance, if some function is between 1 and 7 and has f equals 0 at 2 and 5, you're going to want to take those four numbers, 1, 2, 5, and 7, and plug them into f of x one at a time and see what output is the largest. The largest one is the absolute maximum. The smallest is the absolute minimum. And that's, uh, that's basically everything for absolute minimum and absolute maximum. So what that means, uh, first of all, is that we're going to be using red marker probably next time. Uh, the second thing that it means is that we're ready for the big problem for the day. So here's today's problem. Between 0 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius, the volume V in cubic centimeters of one kilogram of water at a temperature T is given approximately by the formula V equals 999.87 minus 0.06426T plus 0.00850043T squared minus 0.00006796T cubed. Find the temperature at which water has its maximum density. 
Okay, so remember, you're going to want to take that function, differentiate it, set it equal to zero, find your critical numbers, and find out what the maximum is. All right, until then, I'm Augie Kennedy, and thanks for joining. Bye-bye.